Forward grips and flashlights get more attention than the most overlooked part of a weapon system. I'm talking about the scope. Your optic actually has the most potential to increase your lethality. This is where the real innovation in firearms is quietly happening. For decades, scopes were reserved for only a very select few skilled snipers because they were complicated to use, very expensive, and really hard to maintain. Within the last 20 years though, every single rank and file grunt has been issued an optic to augment their shooting performance. This might seem obvious today, but believe it or not, there was a time when running scopes on top of your weapon seemed absurd. It took the Marines two years, for instance. They tested the ACOG for two years before they fully implemented it. That's how skeptical and traditional the military is. But you can't blame them, right? After all, they were using iron sights in combat for, I don't know, like the past 300 years? So the Army is about to choose a winner in the competition for the next gen optic which is being developed hand in hand alongside the 6.8mm NGSW rifle program. L3 Harris and Vortex are in the running to create the US Army's first computer powered scope. L3 Harris sent me exclusive footage of this system in action and I had the opportunity to interview their engineer team. I also spoke with the Army's new Lieutenant Colonel who's in charge of the Next Generation Squad weapon program in order to get a better sense of how this is gonna affect army tactics and doctrine. I think my generation of veterans is probably gonna be just as skeptical of this next gen fire can just fancy computer optic as the last generation was of ACOGs. I asked whether the next gen fire control would still work without batteries, how many troops the army plans to issue these expensive new tools to, and whether or not the added 2.5 pounds on top of your weapon is gonna be too heavy. We'll also speculate a little bit about this change and how it's gonna affect ground combat in the future. But first, let's talk about how we got from iron sights to computer sights, because I think it's one of the most important and least understood parts of military history, which is gonna have huge consequences in the next conflict. Wait, are you telling me all the hours I sunk into learning how to shoot targets out at 900 meters with just my iron sights was for nothing some computer could replace all of it? Cool, I guess I'll just go myself. Time for a quick message from our partner. If you're interested in more content that explains how military weapon systems work, then you'll want to check out Gun Mag Warehouse and their outstanding YouTube channel. Gun Mag has valuable videos that show things like the best way to clear double feeds from your magazine or the correct way to train on pistols. If you're like me, then you like all kinds of mags. You like AK mags, you like MP5 mags, you like M4 mags, you even like airsoft mags. So go over and check out Gun Mag Warehouse's YouTube channel. They upload interviews with some of the military industry's top experts that you won't want to miss out on. Gun Mag has an incredible armory, different weapon systems that they're able to live test fire. Recently, I saw them test shooting flamethrowers, which I have to admit, I wish I had that opportunity. Daniel Shaw gives the rundown over there on the Gun Mag Warehouse YouTube channel, and he has the perspective of a Marine Infantry Iraq War veteran. I've been a big fan of their work for a while now, so subscribe to Gun Mag Warehouse's YouTube channel by clicking the link in the description below and let them know we sent you. Back to the video. So I wanna illustrate just how big of a change combat optics have been. There's a story from Iraq that came out in 2004, right around when the ACOG performance stats were starting to come back from the front lines. And it said, quote, Marines with the ACOG equipped M16A4 in Fallujah got so many headshots against the enemy that until it was closely examined, observers thought the insurgents had been executed, end quote. So the introduction of combat optics on the battlefield was so overpowered that the enemy accused the US Marine Corps of cheating. People couldn't believe these optics were actually that accurate and effective. In order to understand the future of optics, we need to go back and quickly talk about how they became so commonplace in the first place. The origin of scopes traced their roots to Utica, New York, where the first practical rifle scope was invented in 1835. In a book titled The Improved American Rifle, John R. Chapman wrote about how it was the first scope to not break after a few shots. General Malcolm, he's a military general at the time, basically stole that idea and made a better version and then used his military connections to make his scope the standard issue sniper scope in the American Civil War. Sounds like he inspired a couple of generals since then. The reason only a select few had scopes between 1835 all the way to like 1995 is because they weren't durable and they cost too much. 
The field of view was very limited, the eye relief was terrible, and some of these optics like the CCO were reliant on batteries. Many weapons like the AK didn't have good mounting options. These old fixed magnification sniper scopes from like World War II, those are what I would call generation one. When you look at the history of ground combat, you start to notice kind of a pattern where every 100 years or so, the average distance of engagement fluctuates between going shorter, going longer. So for instance, in the 1700s, back when they only had muskets, the average distance of combat was only 75 meters. Once they invented rifling, it went longer to 300 meters. And even though in the 1940s, they already had weapons and calibers that were powerful enough to reach out to like 900 meters, there's another problem. If you can't see the enemy, you can't hit them. And at the time, only a very few amount of select skilled soldiers had scopes. The whole idea of this next gen fire control system is that it makes hitting targets at longer range easier. So you don't need all of that training in order to do that. The first time we started seeing these optics was actually during the 1980s in military tests that were meant to replace the M16. The weapons failed, but the scopes ended up being adopted. It wasn't until 1995 when we first saw the first special forces units start to adopt the earliest ACOG and close quarters combat optics. This is what I would call generation two, which is what we call optics now. The ACOG actually uses a fiber optic to operate, so it works without batteries. In 2008, the army made it their policy for every single rank and file US infantryman to be equipped with some kind of optic. A little over 10 years later, we're now getting to what I would call generation three, which are known as fire control systems. And these distinctions in between how we refer to these scopes are important because they all have these new capabilities. Basically a combination of the ACOG, CCO, RCO, and your iPhone all combined into one. This would be the first ever computerized small arm scope adopted for regular line infantry. I'll explain why this would change every aspect of future ground combat. First, I'll explain how the computer smart scope's new features would be uniquely valuable in a combat scenario. Let's say you're on patrol and you see a target far off in the distance. You adjust your next gen optic from one to six times magnification so that it's all the way zoomed in on the enemy. You hit the laser rangefinder button, which tells the ballistic computer that the enemy is 900 meters away. The digital reticle then automatically adjusts based on the laser rangefinder data. This way you don't have to guess at how much to compensate for bullet drop at that distance. The ballistic computer is also factoring in sensor data like environmental conditions such as temperature and air pressure. There's a dang meteorologist in there. Let's say you know there's a 10 mile per hour crosswind. So you hit another button which automatically adjusts that reticle for wind. In order to conceal yourself better, you lay on your side and you can't the weapon at like a 45 degree angle. The weapon orientation sensor automatically updates the ballistic solution and the reticle appears correctly because the optic knows exactly how you're holding the gun. This optic knows more about you than you do. It's creepy, really. The last thing that you're able to do before firing that you couldn't do in the past is you call out the compass heading that the enemy's located at so the rest of the squad knows where to focus their fire. You squeeze the trigger and easily hit the target 900 meters away, which would have been nearly impossible with the legacy M4, 5.56, and the old ACOG. I would compare this to like the same kind of performance leap as when we went from the iron sights to the ACOG scope. This is another huge leap forward. It consolidates the close quarters and long range combat roles into one position. But what do you say to people like me that only trust iron sights, the old school fundamentals? What if a battery goes out or one of these sensors gets broken on this thing? I don't trust technology. I asked Lieutenant Colonel Headley if this system would work without batteries. And he said it will 100% work without the sensors and without the batteries. Even without those digital and computer chip features, this is still a powerful one to six times scope. If you're starting to get the sense that this is super expensive, I don't think I can even afford to look at it with my eyes. I feel bad for the new privates out there who are gonna lose this thing and then spend the rest of their careers until they're lieutenant colonels themselves paying it off. The next generation squad weapon fire control system, after you hit the target, 
then whispers to you. Nice shot, that was super cool. Okay, maybe it can't talk to you yet, but if anyone at the Army or L3 Harris is watching, please implement that feature next. And just say it was part of your soldier touch point. The next generation squad optic has the ability to send targeting information to your enhanced night vision goggles and the IVAS heads up display system. A lot of people were pointing out in the comments on my Instagram that this optic weighs more, like twice as much as the fixed four times scope ACOG. In fact, it weighs more than even your other variable powered scopes. It's 2.5 pounds. Fellow keyboard warriors like myself were speculating because of this added weight, it might be reserved for, I don't know, only like squad designated marksmen, or that it might be a specialized tool for only that expert shot in your platoon that spends all their days off working on their shooting fundamentals, doing dime drills. I asked Lieutenant Colonel Heedley about how the Army plans to implement this new optic, and he said the plan is to actually replace all ACOGs and CCOs within the close combat force. I was surprised by this. Apparently they will eventually roll this out to every infantryman, cab scout, etc., all of the frontline roles. To me, this makes me speculate that the Army's doctrine and tactics is going to have a major shift to focus on long range engagements that were impossible before. In the past two decades, soldiers got out of hand with modding their rifles, so the idea is here that you're only gonna need the next gen fire control system on your weapon, which I know is gonna be disappointing for everyone who was looking forward to their gun being a reflection of what a cute, special, unique individual they are. They will need to create more long distance ranges and targets out to at least six, 700 meters to get soldiers to start taking advantage of these future weapon systems like the 6.8 and the next gen fire control. The first thing I noticed about this device was that thing sticking out on the top of it, it kind of looks like a reflex sight, right? And at first that's what I thought it was, some kind of close quarters EOTech. But that's actually the laser range finder sitting up there. It's a little bigger than I would have expected. L3 Harris told me, quote, our squad fire control increases probability of hit out to and beyond the max effective range of current issued assault rifles. They officially engage targets at 900 meters with an SR-25 rifle firing 762 by 51 millimeter ammo. I asked why this system is possible now as opposed to 10 years ago, and they said, quote, sensors, laser range finders, and electronic displays have continued to get smaller and more robust over the last decade, and these technological advances have enabled our engineers to minimize size, weight, and power impacts. I asked L3 Harris creators how the digital reticle works, and they explained it's set up with different pre-programmed modes. The operator is able to switch between those modes based on the mission scenario. For example, if a soldier is in an urban environment, they can rapidly bring up a close combat red dot, or if there's a heavy crosswind, the user can bring up a digital wind dot reticle with five and 10 mile per hour holds. If the soldier is still hung over from the night before, they can use the autopilot mode. All right, fine, not yet, but they're designing this for cars, so I'm sure we're gonna have autopilot for guns soon. Looking forward to that L3 Harris, Elon Musk collab. So L3 Harris sent me a great explanation of how the system works, and instead of rewording it and putting it in my own words, I'm gonna leave it as is, because I love how they worded it, except I am gonna replace every time they said user with the word operator, and anytime they use the word target, I'm gonna replace that with the word baddie. So, L3 Harris said, quote, the operation is as follows. When in combat mode, the operator identifies a baddie through the fire control. The operator places a digital LRF reticle on the baddie and lases. At that moment, the range is determined. The environment is sampled. The weapon orientation is calculated and the ballistic algorithm is applied for these variables and inclusive of the weapon and ammunition data. This all occurs obviously in a fraction of a second, nearly instantaneously. Once complete, a range slash environment slash orientation corrected ballistic reticle appears. The LRF reticle disappears and the operator places this corrected aim point on the baddie and engages. End quote. When I spoke to the L3 Harris engineers, they told me that this system integrates with the FWS, which is the Army's new thermal imaging night vision tool. They've successfully hit targets at 700 meters using this system combined with the night optics. This is really impressive when you consider the best we could do with the legacy systems was to hit a target at like 150 meters 50% of the time at night. So this really ups our night capabilities. FWS does weigh 1.5 additional pounds though, an additional four plus pounds. Then you got the 6.8 NGSW rifle which itself probably weighs like nine pounds. So a rifleman's weapon system will be like 13 pounds overall. It's about what a 249 gunner is. I see possibly a slower moving, more heavily armed future infantryman, but I might be wrong. I wanna know what your thoughts are on this new system and its features. 
It's basically halfway to autopilot, shooting baddies at 900 meters and beyond. I especially want to hear from you if you use the iron sights and then ACOG and now are adjusting to this new optic. So I'm your host, Chris Cappy from Task and Purpose. Follow me at Cappy Army on Instagram, and I'll see you next week.